it's Thursday. Should I be embarrassed that I drink my coffee under the covers every morning? Sometimes I feel like I should get out of bed and then start the vlogging. But this is who I am. I don't even know what I'm going to read in this vlog yet. I just finished Animal by Lisa Taddeo. I'll talk about that later. And then I don't even know what I'm gonna read next. I do have a big pickup from the library schedule, not that I need more books. Maybe I'll also, while we're embarrassing ourselves, maybe I'll also show my TBR pile for the first time today. It's bad, it's really overflowing. All right, next time you see me, I'll have washed my face. Hello, joke's on you. I haven't washed my face, but I did get out of bed take my dog for a little W. While we were walking, I listened to an interview with the author of Detransition Baby, which has been all over the booktube world, all over the place. I'm excited to read it eventually when I get a, my hands on a copy, but the interview was really good. It was on The Cut, which is a podcast I enjoy. Clearly she's just done a lot of thinking about gender and femininity and womanhood. And one thing she said was, we're all failing at femininity or we're all failing at gender in some way. Nobody feels like they're doing it right, which is so true. Another thing she said was the Kardashians are a great example of female to female transition because they're putting in all this work to become these more femme versions of themselves with these like fake cheekbones and high contrast makeup and um, they're playing at a high femme exterior. And I can't help but think about how both of those things are products of capitalism's preying on women, right? Like we all feel like we're failing at gender. And that's why we watch <coughs> the Kardashians makeup tutorials and shell out hundreds of dollars for lip gloss and that feeling of failure and not good enough is what drives us to consume to consume everything about the Kardashians to watch the show to spend money on their products to try to be better women so that's what I'm thinking about today did I have too much coffee this morning I will link to the podcast below. Um, give it a listen. Tell me what you think. Tell me what your reactions are. Listen to Tori Peters. Read read some Tori Peters and get back to me. And tell me what you think about this. Maybe I'm misinterpreting her, her thoughts, but I want to think more about this. Hello, I'm back from the library. I have four books here. Um, pretty excited about all of them actually. Milkman, really, I think this, I think this might be a five out of five for me. I have high expectations for this. Grace just read this in her Irish author read-along, read-a-thon, her Irish author read-a-thon, and it looks phenomenal. Idaho. I actually don't know a ton about this, but CJ mentioned this in her good writing, good plot video. So we'll check that out. Minor Feelings and Asian American Reckoning by Kathy Park Hong. I saw this in a bunch of lists that came out after um, the murders in Atlanta last week. And I realized that I haven't read a ton of Asian nonfiction, and this sounds great. Hot Milk. I recently did a video where I reviewed Swimming Home by Deborah Levy, and I loved it. And I mentioned that I was ready after that one book to become a Levy completist. So this will be the next Levy I read. All right, moment of truth. That's the rest of my TBR on top of that radiator. This is like a spare room in our house 
We have a couch and a computer where we watch Netflix. And that's my overflowing TBR pile. I'll take you closer. Let's see, what do we have here? I have, I have a couple backlist Susan Choi. I love all the Susan Choi that I've read. What else do we see here? Oh, this is really embarrassing. I still haven't read Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I know. It's like everyone loved it. Everyone talks about it. It's supposed to be amazing. It's an academic story. I love those. I don't know why I haven't got it done it yet. It's sitting right there, but just haven't gotten there yet. Um, I have some backlist Rachel Cusk here, Arlington Park, and then Cleanness by Garth Greenwell is another one that's all over the place that I definitely want to get to, The Memory Police. Um, oh, here's Pond by Claire Louise Bennett. This was recommended to me a couple years ago. I actually DNF'd it. But I really trust this this woman and um, I think I just picked it up at the wrong time and the you know, just was an off week and I saw a really cheap copy used, so I picked it up. I'm gonna give it another try for sure. What else? Do you see anything else here that you are particularly excited about? Anything you want to sell me in the comments? Okay, what should I read next? I think I'm in the mood for nonfiction. I've read a bunch of fiction recently and I'm just sort of in that mood right now. It sounds good to me. So I think I'm gonna go with Minor Feelings. Let's see what it says. Blurbed by Maggie Nelson and Kesey Langman, which are two faves. If you haven't read Heavy, you should definitely do that. Poet and essayist Kathy Park Hong fearlessly and provocatively blends memoir, cultural criticism, and history to expose fresh truths about racialized consciousness in America. Yeah, I think that's what I'm in the mood for right now. So yeah, we're gonna go with this, and then, and then who knows? So tell me your thoughts about what you saw on my TBR, and where should we go after this? Hello, I'm back. I'm working on dinner. Oh, I broke the goddamn fork. Well, I guess I have to finish this tonight. I'm working on dinner. We are having sabi, which is an Israeli street food. Hi, Ben, my Israeli friend. Um, it's like eggplant sandwiches, sort of, with lots of stuff. I'm not following the recipe. So we'll have some salad. I'm pickling some onions. We'll have some feta. I hard boiled some eggs. Um, yeah. I read the first two essays in Minor Feelings. Really good, I'm really enjoying it. I love a good essay collection. The second essay is called Stand Up and that's the one in which she introduces the concept of minor feelings. She argues that, you know, in traditional race narratives in America, we wanna see like large action and then outbursts to overt racism and minor feelings are the reaction to feeling kept in place, constant oppression. I'm really enjoying it. She references Ocean Vuong, who I love. Oh, also, when talking about minor feelings, she says like, minor feelings are inconvenient to white people. And then she talks about how the standards for white people and minorities are different and how this behavior from racial minorities is, is undesirable or annoying and lionized in white male figures such as Karluv Kneskard. So she praises Ocean Vuong, goes after Kneskard, she's on my team. I'm gonna get started on the salad and then I will talk about Animal, a really good uh, appetizing book to talk about. Okay, Animal. Animal is about a woman named Joan. She is having an affair with a married man. When the book opens, he 
walks into the restaurant where she's having dinner with someone else and he kills himself in front of her. So she leaves Manhattan and goes out to LA. She's in search of someone in Dallas. We don't know why. Yeah, that's the book. There's a lot of rage and violence. I would say tons of trigger warnings for rape, sexual assault, suicide, murder, miscarriage. It is definitely an uncomfortable read and it is definitely supposed to be an uncomfortable read. It actually took me longer to read than I thought and I was sort of thinking like, huh, why is this taking me so long in my inner reading slump? I think that that was really the intention. That was Tadio's intention. When I first started reading this, I was like, huh, is this a thriller? And like, maybe it still is, I don't know. I know, I don't know what a thriller is, but it's definitely not a page turner. It is just so uncomfortable to read. At night, I would be like, wow, I, I need to put this down because I can't, can't be the last thing I read before I go to bed tonight. It has a lot to do, it is a lot about sex, although sex is clearly not the point, right? It's about sex as power and the way that power is used to control people, specifically women and girls. And, you know, it's not about pleasure. The main character, Joan, seems pretty incap incapable of experiencing pleasure. She is very much like a mosh bag character. I found this book to be very mosh, mosh -fegian. If you enjoyed My Year of Rest and Relaxation, I think you would enjoy this book. It's My Year of Rest and Relaxation with Rape and Murder. So it's hard to explain, which is a good thing I like in a book. The writing is beautiful, which you know is important to me. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a wild ride. So I do recommend it. I'm gonna finish making dinner. Try not to chop my fingers off and enjoy my wine and obviously i'll show you my final product here because i'm gonna be so proud all right we have roasted eggplant feta some pickled veggies hard boiled eggs pita um like a minty yogurt sauce a little salad and some pickled onions look at that cuddled up little monkey yeah, I'm talking about you. It's Friday morning. I worked out and took a shower and thought I'd check in before I get my day going. I need to put you down so we can we can chat. This is better. As I said, it is Friday morning. It's pretty gray and yucky out. I have some work to do today. And then the sun is supposed to come out this afternoon. And so I think I'm going to take myself to a wine bar and enjoy some reading with a glass of wine. If you watched my newbie tag, you know that that is like an ideal situation for me. Other than that, not much going on around here. Tomorrow is the first day of Passover. We're not going to do like a traditional Seder. Usually we go to a friend's house. Um, but obviously we're not gonna do that this year. So I think we're gonna have a couple friends in the backyard for pseudo Seder happy hour and drink beer, which is definitely not kosher for Passover and eat some matzah and harosa and not do anything Passover related. And it'll be really fun. And then we'll just work in the garden some more this weekend. I need to go to a nursery and get some seeds. Okay, let's talk about books. I finished Minor Feelings. It's a small book. It's only seven essays. It's right around 200 pages. So I breezed through it in 24 hours, but I think it definitely could have benefited from like a slower, more thoughtful read. I think a few of the essays I definitely will reread. I'm also excited to read around it to read some own voices reviews and just, yeah, look into it. There's so much good reference. I mentioned she references Ocean Vuong, but she talks about a lot of artists, some that I am familiar with, some I'd never heard of. So I'm excited to like read up and see what some of those references are. My initial impression is that this is like a masterclass in nuance. I think that she takes subjects that are often painted in broad strokes 
and really dives deep and thinks about thinks about them on a granular level. I mean, even the concept of Asian American red is such a broad category that represents an entire continent of multiple religions and ethnicities. And one of my favorite essays was called Bad English. And there's a part in the essay in which she talks about the dog is snoring behind me. There we go. There's a part in the essay in which she talks about appropriation of different cultures. And she says, how far can I travel harvesting bad English before I'm called a trespasser? At the time of my writing, this country has seen a retrenchment of identities on both sides of the political spectrum. The rise of white nationalism has led to many non-whites defending their identities with rage and pride, as well as demanding reparative action to compensate for centuries of white plundering from non-Western cultures. And then she goes on to say like, a si obviously that is a justified reaction, um, but a side effect of that has been this idea of like stay in your lane politics in which you you can only speak from your personal ethnic experience. Such a politics not only assumes racial identity is pure while ignoring the messy lived realities in which racial groups overlap, but reduces racial identity to intellectual property. And then she connects this idea to the idea of thinking of art as a commodity in which art is circulates for profit. And then that profit is often, if not always, taken in by the white people um, or people of power. And she says, speaking on this subject, Amiri Baraka offers an invaluable quote. All cultures learn from each other. The problem is that if the Beatles tell me that they learned everything they knew from Blind Willie, I want to know why Blind Willie is still running an elevator in Jackson, Mississippi. In reacting against the market economy, we have internalized market logic, where culture is hoarded as if it's a product that will depreciate in value if shared with others. Where instead of decolonizing English, we are carving up English into hostile nation states. I think that's such a such a good take on this idea that we we are so entrenched in this commodification capitalist thinking that we apply those rules to our we we recognize that something is wrong with people taking with people gaining value and wealth off the idea and works of others, especially marginalized groups. But then when we try to fix that problem, we then apply the profit market logic, which isn't serving to solve this problem when when that market and its logic is the is at fault. Uh, a really good read. And like I said, I'm gonna do some reading around it, I think. And then my next read, I got an exciting package yesterday from our friends at FSG. An advanced copy of Second Place, The New Rachel Cusk. It says tentative publication date of May 4th, 2021. So this is definitely gonna be my next read. What's that you say about seeing all my TBR pile yesterday? I know, but it's the new Rachel Cusk. I have no self-control. So I'm gonna crack this open, hopefully at a wine bar later today. Am I taking casual Friday too far? The best thing about working from home is the Canadian tuxedo, right? The first book I wanted to bring up was Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hall. Sometimes her claims in this book feel a bit offhanded or not explained as thoroughly as I would have liked, but this is still a great entry point into anyone wondering about sort of a nice collective way, especially thinking of how or what the Asian American experience feels like. Update, we're having a good day. Got the goods. Alanis Morissette played on the radio on the way. God is good. Hello. It's Saturday. Um, 
We have the Carhartts on, which can only mean one thing. Yard work day. I'm gonna sow the seeds that I got yesterday and do some other stuff. The dishwasher's running. You can probably hear that, can't you? Um, tonight is Passover. It is supposed to be beautiful, so we're gonna have some people in the backyard to drink beers and eat tangentially Passover-related snacks, like matzo toffee, and I'm gonna make harosset balls. Harosset truffles. Sounds more appetizing. I think I'm also gonna film Jalen's bar in the bookcase tag today. I don't know when that's gonna happen. Here, I'll show you outside. We're working on uh, getting the patio set up. Justin dragged out the patio furniture and the outside rug and hosed them off this morning. Should we do like a rose bush check? Do you see these buds? We're gonna have roses, babies. Babies, there will be roses. All right, that's all I have for you today. I need to get to work. See you in a few hours. Happy Passover, friends. We're making haraset. Mmm, chewed fruit. Yum. Jello. We had a bike ride. We did some yard work. We had a shower. Now I'm gonna record Jalen's tag. And then I realized I should probably talk about the book I'm reading. That would be a good thing to do today, right? Hello. I just recorded the bar in the bookcase prompt from Jalen. It was a great time. Um, I haven't done a lot of these tags, but Basically, you list books that you like. Every time I was like, you know, you should read this. It's a good book. But I stand by it. They're all great, great wrecks. All right, let's talk about second place. We shocked to hear I'm loving it so far. Rachel Cusk. Rachel did it again. About 40 pages in. It's a little guy. It's fewer than 200 pages. It tells a story from the point of view of an unnamed narrator, a woman who lives in a marshy, remote place with her husband, Tony, writes to a painter, an artist, who she is really fond of and invites him to come stay with them. The second place of the title is a little cabin cottage They've built on their property to have artists come stay with them from time to time. Um, a little artist residency situation, a little yado situation. The book is written as a retelling. So our unnamed narrator is recounting this tale to somebody named Jeffers. Because it's written in this style, the narrator is able to reference things that happened before, but also reference things that will happen that haven't happened yet in the narrative and say, I should have seen it coming, or this is when everything turned downhill, right? And, it's, and so it seems to be this idea about how we retell our stories after the fact and how we try to control the narrative along the way. As always with our girl, Miss Cusk, the writing is just out of this world. It is so good. The narrator has a daughter named Justine and about motherhood she writes, when Justine arrived on this earth and seemed to want to stand in the same spot that I was in only I was there first. I could never reconcile myself to the fact that just as you've recovered from your own childhood and finally crawled out of the pit of it and felt the sun on your face for the first time, you have to give up that place in the sun to a baby you're determined won't suffer the way you did. 
and crawl back down into another pit of self-sacrifice to make sure that she doesn't. Where did you get the gall to be so good, Rachel? I'm really excited to go read it right now and sit outside in the sun and do that for a little while before guests come over for some Harosa truffle ball things. That was a good chunk. Was Look a good at that chunk. chunk. It's a good chunk, yeah. It's a good chunks. It's tasty granola. What? What'd you say? I said it's tasty granola. Hi friends. How goes it? It's Monday. Um, I'm gonna sit on the floor here and talk to you all. Got an itchy nose. <laughs> Yesterday was a pretty low-key Sunday. I did a lot of cuddling with my dog. I did get these hairs trimmed and I made granola so that the house would smell like cinnamon. And that's what we did yesterday. I did finish second place. Wow, I forgot how good a cusk feels. This was phenomenal. I have lots of thoughts. Where to begin? I want to put you down so I can gesticulate wildly. How's this? You're leaned against a flower pot. Second place. She was a beaut. As I mentioned before, this is a first person narrative. A woman whose initials M, that's all we learn about her name. She lives in sort of like a remote coastal region with her husband, Tony her grown daughter, Justine, and they have a cabin or cottage on the property where they often invite artists to come stay and do their work. M is a fan of a painter's work who goes by the initial L and she invites him to stay at this cottage, which they lovingly refer to as the second place. This book is about male privilege. That's what this book is about. First of all, Look at the number of dog ears we have here. Our narrator is obsessed with discovering the truth and she feels like Elle, this painter, represents this ability to not be burdened by the necessity to create and recreate and make narrative. He has complete freedom, he has no responsibilities and he can paint art and just show what he sees and the complete truth. Whereas she is responsible for the well-being of so many people, not least of which is her daughter Justine. And women and specifically mothers are tasked with this job of creating fiction, narrative, taking 
what is out in the world and creating something out of it. And because of that, they don't have the freedom to be painters who can relentlessly explore truth in their art. Rachel. Oh, Rachel. Elle experiences this freedom, this lack of burden or responsibility as the freedom to make art that illuminates truth. M, as a mother and a woman, has all of these responsibilities to the world around her. And so she has to make the world. As I mentioned earlier, second place refers to this cabin cottage, that's what they call it in the story, but it also refers to this idea that women are always in, the, in second place. It also refers to this concept of like this second place, this transcendental second place of honesty and freedom that is represented by this male artist. This character struggles through this book and she is dealing with these feelings of burden confronting male privilege, but it does ultimately have a hopeful ending. The idea being that, you know, men or men as represented by Elle in this book go through life without responsibility or burden. They just seek truth and joy. Meanwhile, women toil their days away, but at the end of life, when you come to the end of your life, Elle realizes that there is no such thing as truth. It was all a waste. And women evade death. Women evade destruction by recreating, by carrying the human race forward. Which is to say that at the end of life, men as represented by Elle are full of regret and women as represented by M are full of love. I, I really love this book. I just really love Cusk's writing. I will say that the argument that I put forward as my read of this book is frustrating to me personally in that it equates womanhood with motherhood, which is a constant, constant thing. And as a woman who has cho chosen not to be a mother, that is frustrating. The lack of recognition or discussion or exploration of the burden of womanhood as separate from the burden of motherhood. So I think there are some unanswered questions, some unexplored themes in this book, but overall it was a, it was a five star for me. I really truly loved it. I love you, Rachel. Thank you so much to FSG for sending this to me. You made my, my year. Loved it. Okay, that's all I have. I'm probably going to close the vlog out here because it's Monday and nobody wants to see me sit at my desk for a week. But thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to me ramble about books. Please do tell me what to read next that you saw in my TBR pile. What do we think? Where should we go? What avenues to explore? If you tell me what to read next is wasn't in that pile, I'm gonna be mad. So I don't need any more books that I wanna read that I'm tempted to buy. Okay, don't do it. <laughs>